Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. On this day in history, I'm going back to the year 1930 to tell you about the Hoover Dam. It began, of course, uh, construction. Well, the United States uh, began construction of the Hoover Dam on this day. It's a um, dam that eventually took about five years to construct and 21,000 workers uh, that uh, were part of the construction of the Hoover Dam. It, um, of course, uh, had an average of 3,500 men working every single day on the dam. Um, author Powell Davis, an engineer from the Bureau of uh, Reclamation, originally had a vision for the Hoover Dam back in 1902. And his uh, engineering report on the topic became the guiding document, which was eventually uh, put to use uh, when the con construction eventually began um, in 1930. For many, many years... Actually, the the dam was uh, the construction of the dam finished on this day. Um, for many many years, uh, the water had been a source of contention among um, Western states that had claims on the Colorado River, and so they of course began construction. It took, um, like I said, twenty one thousand men. Um, approval from Congress and, of course, a little bit of controversy here and there before it eventually was fully constructed. A few facts also concerning the Hoover Dam. Initially, it was meant to be called the Boulder Canyon Dam. And, uh, you know, that was mostly because of where it was located and, and uh, the place that they decided that they were going to um, um, you know, uh, create the dam uh, just right next to the Grand Canyon. But eventually, after uh, construction, it was renamed by the guy, the head engineer, um, after President Herbert Hoover in 1930. That, of course, eventually was changed after Hoover left presidency. Franklin Roosevelt, who wasn't a huge fan of uh, Herbert Hoover, then renamed the dam and said it was going to be turned back to the Boulder Canyon Dam. But later on, after Franklin Roosevelt, President Truman eventually then approved it to be called the Hoover Dam, uh, much later in 1947, I believe. Um, also, an entire city was created for the people working on the dam at that time. Um, and that's, you know, some of the people who currently still live in those areas uh, are descendants of the people who uh, built the Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the Ajaokota Ajau Steel Complex. You know, I've, I've heard um, of uh, stories from the Ajaokota Steel Complex and how um, the original plan for, you know, all of it also included a small city, um, which I think they probably achieved in, to some extent, but it, there was also a, a plan for a small city uh, for workers and which for staff and people. Which you know, um, sprung up. Yeah, but not to, I, th I don't think it did to the extent that they had planned, you know, because of the failure of the dam, of the um, <laughs> steel complex to fully kick off and be fully functional. I don't think they, they, they eventually did. But some of those complexes that you see around the Ajakuta steel complex now were uh, constructed way back then uh, while the dam was still, mm. while the, I keep saying dam, while the uh, Ajakuta steel complex was being constructed. Mm. I think many interesting facts about the Hoover Dam, about how, you know, one of the world's largest refrigerators cooled all the concretes that were to be used for the dam and that all the concrete used in the dam can, you know, fill the entire U.S. And about how nobody actually wanted the dam to be called, um, to be named after, you know, President Hoover. He's, it was stated that he's one of the least beloved yeah. presidents. So there was lots of uh, um, opposition to that, but it stood and now it's called the Hoover Dam. Yeah. So, moving on from 1930, I believe, to the year 2005, on this day in history, um, there was a terror attack in the U.S., actually four different terror attacks in the U.S., and this um, was at London's Systems Transit, London's Transit System, okay, in the U.K., in London, all right, so it was on the morning of July 7th, 2005, um, Bombs were detonated in three crowded London subways and one bus during the peak of the city's rush hour. So there, it was basically a synchronized suicide bombings, which you know people had believed to be the work of Al Qaeda. It killed about 56 people, including the bombers, and injured another 700 people. It's said to be the largest attack on Great Britain since World War II. There was no warning for this. These three guys, you know, they had planned this. They picked up the fourth guy on their way. They all wore backpacks with the, you know, these explosives. They entered different, you know, trains heading in different directions. They detonated um, the bombs and basically, you know, killed themselves and other people. Now, these attacks took place as 
World leaders, including British Prime Minister Tony Blair, were meeting in the G7, G8 summit in nearby Scotland. Now, despite um, you know, thought that this probably was a work of Al Qaeda, foreign powers, you know, it was found that these people were actually British and maybe even one was Jamaican. But it was thought to be, um, they were, funny enough, this attack happened on July 7th. By July 16th, the police had investigated about six hours, 6,000 hours worth of footage and found the men July 16th. I mean, look at the, look at the short time. Yeah. Even though they were dead, they were able to trace CCTV footage and found people who carried out this attack. And much later that month, July 21st, another group of four men tried to replicate the attack, but luckily the devices did not detonate. Now, guess what? On the same day of this um, four bombings attack in London, there was a consulting company that ran mock exercise entirely on paper in preparation for a possible terrorist attack in London, similar to one that actually happened. So they were preparing for a mock exercise to say, if such a thing happens in the UK, how can we deal with it? And such a thing happened that same day in reality. So this basically prompted initial conspiracy that, you know, the company, the government had something to do with it, but you found that this exercise was common, it was unaffiliated, and these, these men were let go. So about two other people were in, basically fingered in this attack, but they were cleared two years later. So it was on this day in history that four bombers attacked um, transit station in London in 2005 um, to coordinate the suicide bomb uh, on London's transit system um, with explosions that tore through the transit trains in London underground. I remember, you know, this day very well. Um, it, this was a couple of years after the World Trade uh, Center b uh, bombing in 2001. Um, and it was uh, kind of in the peak of uh, Al-Qaeda um, and its attacks on the United States and on, on, on the West generally in Europe. Um, later on, there was, you know, others in France. You know, I think there was one in uh, Austra Australia or Switzerland. I'm not sure now. Uh, but it was in in that era when there was a lot of those uh, terrorist attacks, you know. But this mm -hmm. also showed uh, the importance of intelligence gathering, yes. you know, for for them to be able to prevent, mm -hmm. you know, later uh, further bomb attacks in the future. Um, I remember that there's also, you know, uh, times when there are certain raids that you hear about um, that, you know, eventually bust um, um, terrorists that we're going to, you know, attack sometime later in the future. Yes. Um, the importance of intelligence gathering, the importance of funding security networks uh, properly that we lack very well here in Nigeria. And also the perspective of, of um, or the idea, you, you know, that um, Al-Qaeda doesn't necessarily, or Al-Qaeda um, um, members or attackers don't necessarily have to be from Afghanistan or Iraq. Because this was at the same time that the war in Iraq was going on, you know, uh, the, the, it started in 2003. Uh, the war in Iraq was going on. They were still, of course, bombing left and right in Iraq and Afghanistan while this happened in the UK. And so it's just, it was just a reminder that terrorists don't always have to come from those areas. You know, they could be British citizens. They could be American citizens. They could be, you know, from, any, from your own country. And there's always a presence of uh, cells, terrorist cells in every country. Um, in the, well, possibly a presence of uh, terrorist cells in every country in the world. Um, and lone, I think they're called lone strikers or lone rangers who also carry out these type of attacks. But, but don't you think that when we look at how other countries, foreign powers like the US, the UK, how they handle, you know, attacks like this, an attack was, was you know, happened July 7th. Almost a week later, they apprehended, or oh, actually the, the people died, but they identified people who perpetrated that attack at many instances throughout history. Why is it that we're not looking in that direction? Let's get like training from people who do it better. It's really why, why, it's, why do we have, you know, you can send up, we used to have things like this, you know, back then. Yes, where we had people get authentic training about how to actually prosecute anti-insurgency war. Why, why don't we have things like that? Because we are in dire need of military intervention in Nigeria. How can, you know, our security situation be in such shambles that people are abducted and parents are protesting and they are threatened with arrest and bullets? You know, so our, our, do you agree with me that we could use some training by foreign powers who know how to do it better? So I don't think we necessarily need foreign powers to train. I think what we um, have lacked for a long time, we, we're speaking about the Hoover Dam now from 1930. Mm -hmm. um, over time, it, at that time, it was the biggest or the highest you know, dam 
Um, over time, they've been able to develop, you know, other dams that have, you know, been more than 700 meters higher than the Hoover Dam. Um, so, but that's where they're coming from. Um, the UK, the US, Germany, France, Russia, they have a massive budget every year for security. And that includes As not just equipment. No, no, we don't. We have, we have as, peanuts as do, compared, to what they, compared to what they have. We would not exactly compare. Our economies are different, so I wouldn't exactly compare them on that level. But um, I am saying that the need for training, it's something, it's something you cannot So, So, you know, so this, is where I'm, this is where I'm headed. They have a massive budget. You know, they do not, um, um, you know, mince words or, you know, shortchange themselves when it comes to spending on security. Um, they spend billions and billions of dollars every year on security and pounds every year on security. We don't. And it's, it's not, I don't think we will blame it on, you know, having two different, you know, economies. Um, we, I don't think we prioritize these things well enough for us to be able to spend, you know, uh, as much as we should on them. Um, we started talking about uh, uh, Boko Haram in, what, 2009 Nine, or so? Yes. Um, since then, we've had enough time to increase our, our budget for security. But because we've continued to do the same things every year, I don't know, it's understand the miracle that we expect to happen. We keep bringing in the army. When we instead should be spending more on intelligence gathering, spending more on um, local security. We've had this conversation on state police for a very, very long time. Exactly. When we talk anything. about intelligence gathering, you hear how they basically rummage through thousands and thousands of because security they footage spend of enough, interviews. Because they spend enough to have cameras. They spend enough to keep those cameras running Every single During Good Luck Jonathan's day. time, we had stories about contracts, you know, to a Chinese yes. company to install cameras on our highways. Where is uh, that? Today? Yes, the Abuja, um, what was that thing called? It was a, some, some uh, CCTV, you know, scam or so in, in Abuja. We're, we're obviously not serious about these things because they spend money. For those cameras to be running every single day, every single minute, every single second, it costs money. And they do not, you know, in any day, any time, feel like, okay, maybe we'd have money for cameras uh, today. Maybe we'd have money for fingerprints. But it, there's so much that they do in order to ensure that their cities are safe. And for anybody who wants to carry out such an attack in the UK, you will be worried that you, you definitely will be scared that you will be caught. Or in the United States, you, you have those fears because the, the, the chances and the loopholes that exist are so little um, you know, for you not to be caught. But here in Nigeria, you can have a serial killer walk around for 10 years and commit murders in, 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 in hundreds, and nobody would ever figure it out. It would just be a... About um, community policing and all of that. You know, they have their system of the 911 where once they see anything suspicious, they inform and alert the police and they get right on it. But our police... Still funding. Our police people will tell you they don't all have All of this is still funding. Yeah. And things like that. So, so, so it's still funding. You know, they invest enough and that's why they have what they have. We don't. Um, we haven't in any way been able to be, you know, to, to open up more avenues with which we can make more money and invest in education, invest in security, invest in infrastructure. We keep giving the same excuse every day. Where we are currently, when economically, we're in such a bad state that there's not even a 2,000 naira extra that can be put into security. Um, if we're serious about it, because we don't even have money to fully fund our budget. We have to keep borrowing every year to fund budget, to pay back loans that we've taken. And so it's, it's just, of, it's, it's, these, these are the effects of a country that has not been serious with these things for a long time. I keep speaking about blocking leakages in government, reducing co the cost of running government in Nigeria. There's so much and so many ways that we can save money and we can make more money, but we don't seem to be taking it seriously. If we have a... A, um, a, you know, ways that we can create systems, create um, better auditing and save 500 million, save a billion, save 2 billion every year, save 200 billion every year from different sources, from customs, from immigration, from everything. We make so much money in Nigeria that just disappears into thin True. air. And so if we have better auditing and we're able to save all that money and put it into infrastructure or put it into security, some of all these things would not happen. How? How can you imagine that 150 kids will be kidnapped from a school and just be taken away? How? Unbelievable. I mean, you hear these things and you can't just imagine that this is real life. It, it, it can, even in movies, these kind of things won't happen. So how is it possible that in 2021, this is a, a country that has been dealing with insurgency for more than a decade. In 2021, we still have a situation where students in their hundreds can just be taken away from a school. And there's no checkpoint. There's nothing that stops them from being taken away. We then start to you know, negotiate or find ways to do, you know, uh, have a rescue efforts you know, to bring these kids back. It makes absolutely no sense. But imagine this happened. Imagine 100 kids were kidnapped in the UK, in the US in 1930. Today, you would not be able to try it. It would be almost impossible because they would have improved 
with regards to intelligence and security and um, you know better ways to protect school children you know by one year later the Minister of Sports, Sunday Diary, I hope that we can bring this up. And, and why I'm bringing this up is just to show that over time, we always fail to look for excellence with the people that we put into, um, into office. Look at what is happening with Nigeria's sports. Perfect example. Men and female um, um, athletics um, um, teams are not getting into the Olympics. We have that and we have a Minister of Sports. At the end of his time as Minister of Sports, I don't think there's anybody who's going to question what he did and what happened to Nigerian sports while he was there. Nobody's going to ask all those questions. They will simply say, oh, is it not Nigeria? We'll laugh over it and we'll move on. Mm -hmm. But there's a person whose responsibility it is that Nigeria sports should be seamless and should, we should be able to break boundaries. We should get the best out of our athletes. Right. But nobody's going to ask him why. We have failed to make it to the Olympics. Nobody's going to ask why don't have the best athletes in the Olympics. And that's the same thing with every other MDA in Nigeria today. There would only, we're even speaking about Ibrahim Magu being given an appointment again. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. So that's, uh, that wraps it up for today in history. Talked about the 2005 attack in the UK and the 1930 construction of the Hoover Dam. Let's take a break here. We'll return to talk more about security.